into Sharia compliant investments. While the fruits support a wide variety of charitable causes. Visit okafsa.org.za to discover how your wakaf can bless our community with a legacy of care. We do, apologize. we do apologize for that glitch. Um, so yes, well. We do for that glitch uh, i'm going to try and get on mr zainal abedin kaji on and he's going to be the host of the session and we will supply you with more information during the course of the program so let's try and get on mr zainal abedin kaji he will be the host of the program this evening and he will bring on the speakers as well
Okay, assalamu alaikum. Are we live? Yes, we are. I'm just trying to get your visual on the screen. So just be on standby. Just give us a minute. Just be we'll get Mr. Zainul Kaji on straight away. Mina, can you perhaps try and get uh, Mr. Zainul Kaji um, on the screen? Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me? Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me now, uh, Hassanay? Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome, everyone. Uh, and good evening. And uh, San Bonani, I think we've got a very wide ranging audience here of Muslims and people from other faith groups. Um, and this is really wonderful to have all of you. Uh, tonight and sorry again for the for the glitches out there. Uh, tonight's going to be a very interesting discussion from very able advisors and uh, commentators and uh, counselors. Actually, actually uh, we have uh, Advocate Sheikh Dr. Munir Abdurraouf, and we also we have Sister uh, uh, Rifka um, Fatar accomplished people uh, and just to give you a brief uh, overview of the program we're going to be discussing a little bit about estate planning death without a will uh, pitfalls to avoid something about estate duty somebody has, has asked about use of uh, somebody has also asked about multiple marriages adoptions the issue about executors the issue about trusts and work up so there's really a very very wide range of topics that that uh, uh, that are going to be covered, and hopefully we will have time uh, sufficient time for Q and A. The, a number of people have actually uh, also submitted questions regarding certain cases, and I think that would really need a lot more in depth uh, discussion. And hopefully our uh, esteemed presenters here tonight would be able to give us further feedback on some of those questions. So uh, our program lineup would be where we have Sheikh uh, Munir first, uh, giving us a 25-minute uh, input. Uh, thereafter, we'll have input from uh, Sister Refka. Uh, she would give us a 25-minute input. Thereafter, we'll have a Q&A. And with that, we will uh, start rounding up the whole discussion. So. Over to Sheikh Munir. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I think my mic wasn't silent. Am I audible now? Okay, shukran. Yes, um, shukran, uh, Brother Zainal. My presentation this evening, or input this evening, with regard to the subject matter of Islamic wills, will be what should be in an Islamic will, right? Um, as far as the requirements in terms of Sharia is concerned. So I'll be starting by looking at a person, um, by way of an example, 
who passes away with an estate worth uh, one million rand. Um, some of us might think a million rand is a lot, but many of us who might have some property or a house would see that uh, the value of that house is at least one million rand in most uh, areas. So if that person were to pass away, what are the various claims uh, or matters that must be seen to in terms of Islamic law as far as his or her estate is, is concerned? So that one million rand, we could refer to it as the gross estate, right? The estate of the person um, prior to any deductions, right? So the person has the house, whatever it might be, money in the bank account, it might be clothes, the value of the clothes, the books, the laptop, the, the computer. And adding up all of this, it gives us an amount of one million rand, which we could refer to as the gross estate. Now, the first thing that must be ensured if once a person dies is that your liabilities must be deducted from the estate, that estate as a first claim, all right? Um, right on top, we would look at the Janaza expenses or the funeral costs. Um, so we must ensure that in our wills, uh, that when we pass away, we are instructing our executor to take the available uh, monies that you have left behind and firstly ensure that you are properly buried in terms of, of Islamic law. Part of liabilities also re 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 require that we should see to our religious debts. And this is something that many of us might be oblivious about, especially in terms of the, the Shafi'i school of law. So if you follow the Shafi'i school of thought or law, you will see that religious liabilities are a requirement and deducted as a first or false part of the, this first class of claims against the estate under the liabilities in terms of Islamic law. So let's say, for example, you pass away and you have not performed a hajj. Um, you have made the the request, the application via Sawu, you've paid the registration fee, you have enough money in the bank, you are by the means physically, financially, and all of that, but you have not yet been accredited. Um, right? Then something happens, you pass away. Could be a car accident, could be a heart attack, whatever the incident instance might be. Now, you are then required to make sure that once you pass away, that your executor is in a position to see that someone performs a badal hajj on your behalf once you have passed away. So someone that uh, had already performed the hajj would then perform the hajj on, on your behalf. So, so you must ensure that such a clause is in your will, stating that my executor must ensure that all my religious liabilities, an example would now be um, the, the hajj or the badal hajj, must be um, dealt with, right? Also concerning the administration cost and all of that. From a Islamic perspective, we're also looking at the debt owed to your creditors. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in the beginning of Islam, when he entered a mosque for a janazah proceeding, for a funeral proceeding, he would ask the question, the person that is uh, laying over here, does he have any debt? Does he have any creditors? If the answer was to the affirmative, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam would then turn around and he would say, Sallu ala sahibikum. You, you make salah on this person, make salah on this companion. Uh, which shows us that even though the janaz of salah is a... Um, a communal obligation, it is a fardu kifaya. Um, someone has to do it. But the Prophet وسلم, was making a statement in this regard. So we must ensure that uh, all our creditors are seen to once we, we, we pass away. Um, by Quranic injunction, we find that the longest verse in the Quran uh, refers to um, uh, commercial transactions or credit transactions, and we it's, it's stated that uh, it must be reduced to writing and they speak about two witnesses and all of those things. Um, at the same time, 
if that was not done, it must be dealt with in terms of the will. And we all know that uh, the hadith that plays uh, so much on the radio station where it says, do not let two nights pass and you have a wasiyah to make and that should be beneath your pillow. That hadith uh, actually refers to if you have not entered into a, an agreement in writing with witnesses and so forth, uh, it might just be when you pass away that your creditors will not be given their rightful due. And in order to avoid that, you put that document beneath, beneath your pillow stating that um, if I were to pass away this evening, which is possible, that uh, my executor or my family must ensure that my creditors re refer to on this document and my signature pinned here too must be, um, must be sorted out. Right, so this is very important as far as uh, liabilities is concerned. And this could be incorporated into the Islamic world by stating uh, very uh, um, expressly that I instruct my executor of my estate to ensure that all my religious liabilities are, are, are sorted out in terms of Islamic law. And so once that amounts are deducted, uh, which, would, which would also include the administration costs to, 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 to administer the estate or to wind up the estate, is deducted as the first group of claims. We then sit with the, with the remainder, which is now what we could refer to as the net estate. Right. So the gross estate minus the liabilities in the various forms, we're sitting with a, a net estate. Now, let's say those liabilities in total was 100,000 rand. So the person was, uh, he died with a, a, a gross estate of a million rand. We deducted the 100,000 rand and we're sitting with a, 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 a net estate of 900,000 rand. Now, from the 900,000 rand, we have to deduct the wasuya claims. Right? The wasuya is a one terminology we should understand in terms of Islamic wills. And the next terminology we'll look at a bit later on is what we refer to as a mirath claims. So after liability claims, we, secondly, we, we deduct the wasiya claims. And lastly, we will look at the mirath claims. Now, under the wasiya claims, we find that there are um, certain restrictions. Right? So you can bequeath as a wasiya up to a maximum of one third of the net estate in favor of any person or institution, for example, or any person that is not a Mirath recipient, right? So you can't inherit in two capacities. You can't inherit from the Wasuya claims as well as the Mirath uh, claims. That is the general uh, uh, um, rule. Um, the exception would be where the Mirath recipients actually um, consent to the Wasiya claim in your favor. Right? But we'll discuss what, what is meant by all of what I was saying now. All right. So now we sit here with 900,000 rand. And you are allowed to, for example, bequeath that uh, 100,000 rand, 200,000 rand, up to a maximum of 300,000 rand in this example, because the net estate is. Uh, 900,000 rand, one third would be 300,000 rand maximum in favor of any person who does not inherit from the Mirath claims. For example, your, your father, your mother, your son, your daughter, or your surviving spouse. Right? So this is very important as well. Because once the Wasi has been dealt with, the Mirath is basically distributed in terms of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had ordained in the Quran. In uh, Surah Al-Nisa, in chapter uh, 4, verses number 11, 12, and, and 176. All right, so it might just be there are a number of, of problematic areas. Let's say, for example, you have a a child that was um, conceived out of wedlock. And that is one of the questions that we, we've been asked. Um, does that child inherit right, in terms of Islamic law? Um, then we have to distinguish between the Wasiya claims, or Wasiya estate, and the Mirat estate. The child conceived out of wedlock 
could inherit from the uh, Wasiya estate, but not necessarily from the Mirath estate. So let's give a bit of context to this matter as well. Firstly, does a child out of wedlock uh, inherit? Now, the, the answer is not, not very simple. If you look at the position of a child as far as inheriting from his or her mother, the simple answer is yes. That child inherits from his or her mother. Uh, whether or not the child was uh, conceived in wedlock, born in wedlock, conceived out of wedlock or born out of wedlock, all those examples or instances, that child will definitely inherit from his or her mother. There's no disqualification as far as that is concerned. However, the position of that child inheriting from his or her father um, is a bit of a problem. If the mother and the father were married in terms of Sharia, in terms of Islamic law, at the time when that child was conceived, then definitely that child would inherit from both uh, the mother, we see definitely, but as far as the father is concerned, the child will also inherit from the, the father because that child was conceived in wedlock as well as born in wedlock. However, it does become a bit of a problem if that child has been conceived out of wedlock. Where the child, uh, where the parents of that child or the biological parents of the child were not married to each other at the time where the child was conceived. Now, in that instance, um, as far as the father is concerned, if those biological parents married each other and the child was born six months or more after the nikah, there is a rebuttable presumption that the child was conceived in wedlock and that child will be deemed to be uh, the legal or the lawful parent of that father as well, as long as the, the birth took place more or six months or more after the actual nikah um, in this regard. However, it is also possible that, that that parties decide not to marry each other or they only marry each other maybe many months after the pregnancy. And in that instance, uh, when the parties marry each other, the child could be born within one month, within two months after the, the nikah. And in that instance, uh, the child would be disqualified from inheriting from the father's estate. Now, in that instance, we now have to distinguish between the Mirath estate and the Wasiya estate. That specific child would be entitled to inherit from the Wasiya estate, which is now that 900,000 rand, up to a maximum of one third of that estate if the father decides to make a wasiyah in favor of that child. All right, so in this instance, he could then decide to, to bequeath to that child um, one third of the estate, which is 300,000 rand in this example. He could also decide then to bequeath the same share as the other sons would inherit uh, in terms of Islamic law, All right? Uh, it could be more, it could be, be less. But what we're stating now is that um, there is a possibility, but it is not automatic that the child will inherit. And therefore, if you're drafting your Islamic will, you, you, should, you could ensure that the child inherits from the uh, wasiya estate. All right, the same would apply with regard to an adopted child we, you have decided to take on. Um, be in mind, in terms of Islamic law, that child is nonetheless um, entitled to inherit um, from the um, biological father, even though lawfully they say there is no time. All right, so, so keep that, that in mind. Okay, that is enough said concerning the wasiya as far as adopted children and children conceived out of wedlock. Um, that wasiya can also be given to any other um, individual or institution who do not inherit as Mirath uh, beneficiaries. Right, so you can give it to, let's say, Oqar, South Africa, you give it to Sanzaf, you can give it to the local masjid, you give it to your neighbor, as long as the, those persons are not uh, your compulsory or your Mirath beneficiaries. So let's say in this instance they have then bequeathed 
or you have decided in your Islamic will to bequeath that one maximum of one third, um, dividing it in, in, in two halves, so one six in favor of the local masjid and one six in favor of uh, your ex wife, right? For example, right? That's allowed because she, you're no longer married to her. There's no um, mirath uh, tie um, of that ex wife to your estate, so you, 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 could, you could do so. In this example, we're now sitting with um, a, a, a remainder of 600,000 rand. Now, when looking at the Mirath estate, that is now the final part of your will or the Mirath clause of your will. There are two ways uh, to deal with this. The first way would be to look at what the Sharia says, who your lawful beneficiaries are in terms of Islamic law. So let's say, for example, when uh, uh, at this current point in time, you might have a mother who is alive, you might have a father that is alive, a, a son who is alive, and a daughter who is alive, and you might have a widow who is alive. Now, all of these persons are your compulsory beneficiaries, right? You are, they refer to as the Miraf beneficiaries, and they inherit in terms of the Quranic injunction, um, verse number 11, 12, and 176 of Surah Tun Nisa, which are the primary um, verses of inheritance. Um, all right. In the, I see I have five minutes left. So, so basically, the, the one way to, to deal with the matter is to work out what the shares are in terms of Islamic law and to draft those clauses into the will. Right? That is the one way of doing it. The possible uh, uh, um, problem that could arise here is if the situation changes. Let's say you have one son when you drafted the will initially, but later on you have another son, it would then mean that the second son is not catered for in terms of the will. Right? Same with divorce and the parents passing away. There might be certain consequences because of the developments, and it might be the consequences in terms of Islamic law is not necessarily the same consequences in terms of South African law. The second possibility would be where the person actually says in the will that I then leave my estate in terms of Islamic law. And for purposes of dealing with this, uh, my executor should then approach an Islamic institution like the Muslim Judicial Council SA, and they should then uh, issue an Islamic distribution certificate stating who my lawful heirs are at the time of my death. Right. And um, in that instance, you will find that even though the situation might change, that nonetheless, uh, the certificate will be issued based on the facts that were applicable at the time of you um, passing on. Right. So in both instances there, you will find that uh, your estate, as far as the liability claims are concerned, that must be Sharia compliant. As far as the Mirath claims are concerned, that should be Sharia compliant. And as far as the Wasiya claims are concerned, that should also be um, Sharia compliant. And by doing that, then um, when we pass away, when you pass away, they will find that um, you, have, you can worry about the, 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 the bigger things as the whatever the questions in the grave, what that is about. And uh, rest assured that your executor that you have approached um, or nominated in your will will then deal with your will based on freedom of testation. As you have stated what should happen over there, and it will be in terms of um, Islamic law. All right, I think that was uh, the time allowed for me for my um, input on the subject matter. And I, I hand you back to, to Brother Zainul Abidin. Shukran. Jazakallah khair, uh, uh, Sheikh Munir, Dr. Munir, Advocate Munir. So, alhamdulillah, jazakallah khair for that. Uh, brothers and sisters, listeners, viewers out there, I think uh, Sheikh Munir has covered quite a few items regarding the Islamic world, janazah expenses, religious debts, uh, debts to creditors, the wasiyah, he uh, elaborated uh, on, on the issue of children born out of wedlock. Then, of course, he discussed the issue about Mirath beneficiaries. 
which are the Farayid compulsory Quranic beneficiaries. beneficiaries. So with that, I just would like to also mention that uh, Sheikh Munir has uh, written a number of articles. Uh, he's published uh, very many uh, uh, chapters in books. He's got lots of publications under his belt. And really, we, 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 I think we really have somebody who's really, really uh, well, uh, well versed on the issue of uh, Islamic inheritance. Uh, with those few words, I think we're going to go into the next speaker, uh, who is Refka, uh, Refka Fatar Ho Yi. Uh, Refka is an exco and Remco director at the national law firm STBB, that's Smith Tabata Buckingham Boys. She manages the Claremont branch in Cape Town Southern Suburbs. After 10 years of successful practice as Refka Fatar attorneys, uh, she also merged her firm with STBB in 2008. She is the national head of STBB's Wills, Estates, Trust and Curatorships Department and also specializes in conveyancing and all aspects of property law. So I think we're going to be listening to her for the next 25 minutes. Uh, her inputs will also cover some of the pitfalls that we need to avoid in uh, drawing up wills and also uh, some of the uh, issues regarding uh, from a legal perspective, South African legal perspective on uh, drafting, uh, uh, drafting our wills. Jazakallah, over to you, uh, Sister Refka. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Thank you, Uncle Zeno. I'm so excited to be chatting to you, and there's so much I want to share with you. And thank you to all the viewers for all your questions that you've sent through. It's helped me to just kind of limit what I'm going to be saying tonight to what you're specifically interested in. And so I'm going to try and answer as many of those questions um, as far as possible as I'm speaking. And then if you've got any questions, do pop them in the chat. And after this, we also have a nice Q&A session and um, between Chef Munir and I will um, answer as many questions as we can. And then inshallah, the ones we don't get to, we'll just um, submit the answers and that will be posted on the events page. And so when we're drafting our, our Sharia compliant wills, it's so important as South African residents to understand that we fall within the context of the South African legal system. And when it comes to wills and uh, estate planning and then um, estate administration after we pass away, we need to look at a number of um, different acts and regulations whilst we're still trying to make sure that we've got Sharia compliant wills. And so one of the first questions that people always ask is, why would I need you to, go to draft my will? Why can't I draft it myself? And I think that the fact that we get so many questions um, at these kind of seminars and workshops um, just speaks to the fact that a will is certainly not a simple document. Um, it's the only document that's going to govern what happens to all of the assets and your debts um, that you've accumulated over your lifetime. And also, um, it's got to deal with your, your legacy and it's got to deal with Sharia compliance and you also want to make sure that your family is taken care of. So all of that responsibility is only in this one document. And so I think um, certainly from my point of view as an attorney, I think you should certainly get advice um, and have someone uh, draft it who, um, who is knowledgeable. And if you're drafting it yourself, have someone look at it. Because the last thing you want to do is leave an incomplete, a potentially invalid, um, and also a very impractical will. And in the short space of time that I've got this evening, I want to spend time on the practicalities of our wills. So to paint the picture, imagine the scenario, which is quite common. We've got mom and dad who were married uh, Islamically, but they also married in community of property and that's still the case for lots of our older generation uh, maybe even people my age you they find themselves married in community of property but also married by nikah and so that's a good starting point because when you're drafting your will you need to understand what marital regime you fall into so for example if you're sitting down with your parents and they're married in community of property or you're taking them to an attorney 
understand that dad's will is going to govern half of what he owns because he's married in terms of South African law in community of property. So he actually only owns half of the property. So dad's will legally can only deal with half of the property, not the full property that he might think he's dealing with. And similarly to if he's got, if he's a member, the sole member of a CC, for example, and he runs the family business, he actually only owns half of that membership of the CC. You know, mom actually owns the other half, even if she's got absolutely nothing to do with um, the day-to-day -day running of it. So just think of those sort of things when you're busy with, um, with properties. And as we go through this, also just think about your own um, marital status. And as we go through it, I'm going to chat about costs as well. And another thing people are often ask is, um, should I have a single will or a joint will? And a joint will is just one will that is signed by two parties. Let's use mom and dad as the example. So irrespective of how people are married, in community of property, out of community of property, married Islamically, only um, some couples um, have a joint will. What that means is that there's one will that you either have mirrored um, your intentions, so, um, or you can have completely separate clauses. For example, dad's going to have his Islamic is, mom's going to have her Islamic is. Um, they might have completely separate wishes in their wasiya portions of that one third, um, but yet they've reflected it in one joint estate. Uh, one joint will. I do recommend a joint will if your um, your wishes are quite mirrored and they're almost identical. But when you've got very specific clauses, especially something like the wasiyat, which is where freedom of testation comes in, and you can do with your one third what you what you want to. Um, I do recommend then that we have single wills for each party if they become too different, the, the terms in the will. If you've got a joint will, what practically happens is, let's say dad passes away first, the joint will is, is lodged with the master's office together with all the other reporting documents and the master of the high court is where um, all the deceased um, estates are reported and each milestone that we complete as executors that then gets um, submitted to the master and the master then gives us the go ahead to go on with step two and three and so on. So that joint will is lodged with the master's office and if mom who is the surviving spouse does not subsequently draft a new will in years to come or down the line when she passes away that joint will that original joint will that's lodged at the master's office is her will. It's still her will because she hasn't updated it. So when mom passes away, we then report her estate to the master's office, but we then state in the cover letter that mom um, mom was a, a signatory to the joint will in dad's estate, and we give the master dad's estate number and, um, and a copy of the joint will if we've got it, and then uh, mom's estate is administered according to that same um, joint will that was lodged years ago maybe so but of course with everybody whether you have a joint will or a single will I always recommend that you update your will when um, different milestones in your life take place when someone passes away when there's um, another child when you've uh, immigrated and we'll chat about uh, foreign wills in a minute um, you know when you get divorced or when when circumstances change and and when there are financial circumstances maybe you've sold your business you've close down um, shop and you're retired and you want to look at your will because you might have um, put certain bequests or even your wasiyat that you might not be able to financially be able to um, achieve or comply with now that you're retired and you've maybe traveled or you've spent money or post-COVID people went through quite a bit of financial strain with their businesses but yet you've left these bequests which is what the the wasiyat clauses are they special bequests that you're leaving to certain people but you might not be able to afford that now a year or two later so you'd want to look at that again um People also ask me about um, executors. So, of course, I, as an attorney, I act as executor on, on hundreds of wills. And if I refer to the word um, executrix, it's just the female um, term for executor. Um, anyone can be nominated in your will as executor. Um, of course, it should be a major, not a minor person. And... Um, I think the one thing I want to leave you with is whilst a lot of people nominate their surviving spouses or one of their children as executors, 
it's not only an administratively intensive role. You also need to liaise with so many government departments all the time. You've got to deal with SARS, um, the Deeds Office, the Master's Office, um, every institution that your parent um, dealt with. So, you know, if you've got bank accounts at various institutions, you've got investments at various institutions, um, you've got um, all sorts of... Um, accounts or even just subscriptions, you know, that executors going to have to literally step into your shoes and close off all of those things and engage with them. So it's got to be someone who's at least going to be savvy to be able to speak to um, all of these institutions. When you are the executor, just note that um, at the moment, SARS, um, once the executor's uh, personal e-filing login profile linked to your role as executor so for example i get sms by sars all the time because i've got um, hundreds of of estates that i administer under my name and so sars links all of those to my personal profile so if you've got a nominated executor who is maybe a housewife for example who's not okay with um, with SARS or isn't even a registered taxpayer, that's going to be problematic. Um, having said that, if you do have, if you are appointed as executor and you don't have a clue what to do or you're not interested or you're not familiar with anything, an executor can certainly sign a power, a special power of attorney and grant someone like myself authority to step into your shoes as executor and administer the estate, which is what we do all the time um, because, you know, most wills, uh, quite a few people nominate their surviving spouses or a child or um, someone who's just not um, capable of or, or practically able to take care of the estate administration. So we do that. I then get asked, well, um, what happens if my child um, acts as executor? Can she also be an heir? There's no, um, there's no um, prohibition or any limitation to your rights as an heir when it comes to being executor. The only limitation is when you act as a witness. So I don't recommend that anyone who's going to be either a wasiat heir or a, a residuary heir um, acts as and signs as a witness, neither to um, the spouse of such a person. And so I had a client who, um, who passed away and his daughter's husband um, had witnessed, but years ago, back in the day when they were just date dating. Um, and then, of course, subsequent to that, they got married. And um, it just adds to complications because in terms of the Wills Act, there are um, limitations. And so what the limitations are, just very quickly, are if you've got a... Um, if you are nominated as, as an heir in, in someone's will, but you also witness in terms of South African law, and then we always have to go back to South African law. In terms of South African law, if you witness a will in which you are an heir, your inheritance will automatically be limited in terms of South African law to what you would have inherited if your parent had died without a will. And so that means you would then inherit in terms of your interstate succession uh, share. So let me give you an example. If, um, if you are inheriting from your dad and you're entitled as an Islamic heir to 30% um, um, of his estate as, as an heir, um, but you've witnessed the will. And in terms of interstate succession, there are certain um, uh, thresholds, thresholds and shares that go to, to interstate heirs. And um, so in terms of interstate succession, in terms of South African law, if you had inherited from your dad, if he hadn't had a will, you might have only inherited, say, 15%. So in terms of South African law, your 30% is now limited to 15%. What that means is that when we attend to the estate administration, you know and your family knows that they want you to get your Islamic share. But practically on paper, in terms of what we're administering, we won't be able to give you more than that as far as the master's office is concerned. So we'll have to go through the estate administration process and document on the liquidation and distribution account that you're only getting the 15% because the master will not allow you to get any more than that. Um, that 15% is recorded. That's what you get paid out 
on distribution by ourselves as executors and then between your siblings you're going to have to do the redistribution or we'll help you do that but we do the redistribution so that you end up getting the share you were supposed to get the problem with that as you can imagine is you have to have buy in an agreement from the heirs because there's always someone and there's always you you know you've got those family members i deal with um, those kind of, those families all the time as soon as there's an opportunity for dispute there will be a dispute and so you want to ensure that your will is not only practical but carefully thought out and well worded so that we avoid you know these kinds of disputes as soon as there's an opportunity for a dispute i promise you someone's going to be unhappy um someone's going to not agree to something and when it comes to wills and redistribution of assets and inheritance um you're going to need 100 percent um, agreement by all the heirs it's not a case of oh 80 percent have to agree to something so i mean on that when it comes to um, redistribution. I'm going to want to chat about about the property in in an estate, especially the family home, in a minute. But while we were chatting about executors, people also ask about costs, and so the executors fee is uh, based on a statutory tariff, which is three and a half percent of the gross asset value. Um, so that would be my fee if I'm administering the estate. But of course, it's negotiable just based on the amount of um, of work involved and often people will start out and say oh it's just a simple estate and it's it's never a simple estate no matter how big or small an estate you still have to go through you know all the steps if your estate's worth more than 250,000 rand which most people's estates are you have to run the full gambit of the whole estate administration process and um, at the moment that's taking about 18 to 24 months unfortunately because we're linked to so many um, institutions we've got to deal with as I said banks um, investment houses insurance companies um, you know SARS the deeds office the master's office and so on um, one of the expenses is of course the master's office fee that's it's not a huge amount depending on the the value of your estate um, if you've got a small estate that's under 400,000 rand you would then um, pay only a 600 rand master's fee that escalates based on the value of the estate up to a maximum of 7,000 Rand. So 7,000 Rand sort of covers a 3.6 million Rand estate um, and above that you're going to end up paying a 7,000 Rand master's fee. Um, then of course you've got, as I said, the executor's fee. If you've nominated a surviving spouse or a child as an executor and you haven't put in wording because you've drafted this will yourself or you've asked someone to draft the will who isn't um, familiar or competent in drafting a will um, and they haven't put in the security clauses so you might have seen those wills where you see you say my executor is exempt from furnishing security the security referred to is a bond of security. It's an insurance policy to say that the, the um, executor is not going to go all dodgy and run away with funds. And you and I know that happens, unfortunately. So when you nominate a surviving spouse or child as executor, um, they are automatically exempt from providing security. Um, but you've still got to um, take care to put that clause in that your executor is um, um uh, doesn't have to provide security is exempt from it um, because you need to understand that if that clause is not in and your nominated executor has to uh, obtain security a lay person cannot obtain a bond of security in this country bonds of security are only issued to attorneys and maybe other professionals like accountants but certainly ourselves as attorneys so i end up by default acting as executor or executrix because um, there wasn't a clause exempting the executive from furnishing security. Someone has to obtain a bond of security, and that means I have to step in. Um, a bond of security is very is an unnecessary expense for an estate, so make sure your will does have that clause in it, or contact us if you need us to look at it, because a bond of security costs 0.5% of the gross asset value per annum as a premium, so and that's paid by the estate. People also ask who pays the all the costs involved, all these costs that I'm going to speak about today and that I'm already speaking about, who pays those costs? The estate covers the costs. So um, when it comes to, um, and so you can see on the screen, we've got some of the costs associated and we'll go through those now. When you're dealing with 
any of these expenses and when you're planning so i want you to think about after this think about what you own and think about what you owe and is there sufficient cash liquidity in your estate whether it's um, available cash or assets that would need to be sold or life insurance or any other investments that your executor could tap into that you have access to or that you've made provision for for after your death to cover your debts as Sheikh Munir says we have to make sure that we um, that we're settling our debts before we can of course advance funds to our um, for, to our CF heirs in terms of the bequests and then of course to our residuary heirs who are expecting to get inheritance free of um, of debt and unfortunately what happens in the real world is that um, on a weekly basis I have to sit across from families and explain that yes your dad ran a, a successful business but um, unfortunately taxes weren't taken care of and we'll chat about taxes in a minute or um, Yes, your dad, um, you know, provided and paid off the and, and was paying the bond monthly, but now he's no longer around and he there's no one left to um, to service that bond monthly. And unfortunately, since the Consumer Protection Act has been around, um, life insurance is no longer a legal requirement when you register a bond. And the immediate impact of that that I saw as a conveyancer dealing with bonds and properties is that when you when you don't make something compulsory on a South African, like forced savings and forcing someone to have a bond, the older properties where people had bonds in the old days, they've all got life insurance. But the um, the more recent, in the last um, certainly 15 years or so, if you give people an option, they're not going to take out life insurance. So take out life insurance. Make sure that you've got provision to not only settle your debt, but that you've got provision that there's still money in the kitty so that you're leaving your home to your family, but have you made provision as to who's going to have the money to pay the rates and services every month and, you know, basic things like that and the insurance. So more and more we're dealing with estates where there is no life cover. So imagine your family is inheriting your home, um, but they now have to service the debt. What happens with that when it comes to that's the under bond costs? So let's say mom and dad, um, they're married in community of property. So mom owns 50% of the property. Dad owns 50% of the property. Dad passes away. There's a bond on the property. That bond, like every debt, every debt has to be settled and taken off the name of the deceased so that we can finalize the estate. And what that means is that when it comes to a mortgage bond, the bond is in the name of whoever owns the property. So if mom and dad own the property, then the bond will be on mom and dad's names as the mortgagors. And that means that when dad passes away, the banks and the master's office will want us as executors to remove dad's name from that bond or cancel the bond. Now, if you've got a strictly Sharia compliant will, you've got that one liner will, which um, I personally don't like, and I'll explain why, because it doesn't make provision for all the possible um, scenarios that we could put into play uh, when it comes to an estate, and we'll chat about that now. So your estate just says, I want my entire estate left to my um, Islamic heirs. What that means is every asset has just been left to all of your Islamic heirs. So they're all going to share in the property and they're all going to share in the business and they're all going to share in the cash that's left over after you've paid debt. So let's talk about the property for a second. So mom and three kids are inheriting this house. Mom might not be working, one of the children might be working. So four people are going to inherit the house. But remember, that's half the house. Mom already owns the other half of the house. But dad was the one who actually paid off the bond. So you've got a number of options here. The worst option is, of course, to sell the property. So we're trying to always keep the property for the family unless we're really, really in a, in a sticky financial predicament and we have to have those um, terrible conversations. Um, if the family wants to keep the property, but there's a bond that still needs to be paid, and there's no life cover and there's insufficient cash to cover that. We have to then look at um, the parties who are going to own the property um, and see if any of them are able to take over the debt. And we'll chat up if any of those are minor ears in a second. Let's just assume mom and the children are all over the age of 18 and um, maybe one or two of them are working and they would qualify to take over 
dad's share of the debt because mom's share of the debt mom still got uh, 50 percent of the bond right is 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 her responsibility so let's say the two children qualify to take over the debt we then apply for a substitution of debtor we don't cancel the bond so chat chat to me if you need that kind of assistance because it's a cheaper um, quicker process where we then get the banks to look at the credit worthiness of the, the children to see if they can qualify to take over the property the, the loan and then we don't have to cancel the bond because to cancel the bond, whether there's a settlement figure there or not, even if it's a null bond, it's going to cost 6000 a day just to cancel your bond. And then you're going to have to pay to register a new bond. And there's thousands of rands on an initiation fee on a new bond. So you want to try and rather do a substitution of data where we're just substituting the name of um, of dad. So, um, whew, okay, so we're on 8 o'clock. So I'm rushing through. I've just got a couple of minutes. And then um, I just wanted to say to you, as we're going to go into the questions, um, so we've got transfer costs and people often ask, well, who's going to pay those transfer costs? And is it the heir who's got the most money? Or um, And it all comes down to this pro rata share. So if you've got your heirs who inherited in um, Islamic shares, then and if there's a shortfall, if the estate can't cover any of the expenses, it doesn't matter if it's transfer costs or taxes or anything like that, then we have to um, pro rata the expenses according to the share. So unfortunately, if mom is inheriting one eighth, mom's liable for one eighth of the shortfall if, they, uh, if there's insufficient funds. And then of course, mom doesn't have any money because mom's not working. So then we have to look at, are any of the other heirs going to assist mom and does she owe them? And so I think it's important to have a look at what your debts are when you're doing that kind of estate planning so we can um, help you with that. And then very quickly before I um, cut off and then we carry on to the Q&A session, I want to quickly talk about taxes for a minute if I can. And so um, there are so many taxes that come into play when you pass away and I want you to be aware of it and chat to us as attorneys or chat to your accountants. They are your, you can't hide anything from SARS. So you're going to have all the skeletons in the closet come out. And so if you didn't pay your, your income tax, all of that's going to have to be paid. SARS pretty much audits all estates at the moment. And so you'd have to pay all your, we'd have to pay your arrears from, um, from hopefully your cash assets or assets have to be, um, have to be sold. If there is, um, there is an exemption when it comes to a primary residence that we're transferring, we can certainly hopefully get away with not paying capital gains tax, um, but there will be capital gains tax payable. If you've got a second property or you've got uh, shares in a business, we'll have to pay, your estate will pay capital gains tax when we transfer that to heirs. And of course, um, we'll chat in a minute on, um, on, on estate duty. So we'll get to some of the Q&A and I'm going to hand over to Uncle Zainal and I'm sure we'll get to some more questions in a bit. Okay, Jazakallah Khair and uh, Sister Rivka. And by the way, uh, anybody wants to view her PowerPoint, you can view it on the OCAF South Africa website. So Rivka has actually gone through quite a few issues here, uh, marriage in community of property, marriage by nikah, uh, having single or joint wills, uh, the executor's appointment, very important, whether you're appointing family members or whether you're appointing a lawyer, uh, then you need to also look at uh, the issues of uh, signing the will, who signs the will, is it an heir that signs the will or uh, a non-heir? This could uh, potentially be a pitfall and it could uh, be detrimental to the heir as well. The costs of uh, the estate administration, the length of time that it takes for the winding up of the estate, I think that's a major issue, and especially nowadays with the, with, with the performance that we have at, at government. Uh, then the issue of security that needs to be provided to uh, the estate, to, or to the master rather, but the cost of the estate, and very important is the issue of liquidity. Uh, very often, uh, when when there's a person that passes away, there isn't sufficient cash even for living expenses. So uh, one needs to ensure that when we're doing estate planning, we also have sufficient cash so that uh, at least the home fires and there's food on the table, the rentals can be paid, the water and electricity can be paid, and so on and so forth. So 
uh, I think with with all those Jazakallah uh, khair. We will jump into the Q and A now. There's literally hundreds of questions, and I think we we're going to some of your some of your questions may have been answered in both the sessions, but but let's see if we can actually tackle some of them. I think the first one is what happens when you pass on without a will and that is that is a crucial question and maybe uh, you know Rifka can answer that in 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 a, in a minute um shukran lovely question and so the estate process is exactly the same when you pass away with or without a will with one big exception which is um, delay and possible dispute. Um, so remember, as I said when I spoke earlier, we're dealing with the South African legal system, but at the same time we want our estates administered in terms of Sharia. And now you haven't left that direction in the form of a will. So the default position will always be, unfortunately, the South African legal system. And so you then end up reporting the estate as interstate, meaning without a will. And then if the family wants the estate administered not in terms of the interstate shares of South African law, but in terms of Sharia, then all the heirs would have to agree. And, um, and then we just obtain a, um, an MJC Islamic distribution certificate. We submit um, to them. They don't just issue it. We have to give them a set of all the documents we would have given the master's office, which is, you know, the death certificate and everyone's IDs and all of that fika. And then they issue the um, MJC uh, distribution certificate and we lodge that with the master. The master doesn't turn that down at all. We lodge an original and then they allow us to administer the estate in terms of um, Islamic law. If the family has not reached agreement, then unfortunately the default is um, interstate succession. But the estate process is the same. The costs are exactly the same. No costs differ if you die with or without a will. So, so what happens? Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so what happens, just uh, following on that question, uh, if you pass on without a will, and you don't have any heirs. So if you pass away and you don't have heirs, I've actually got one of those now. Um, people always just assume, okay, it goes to the it goes to to the state. So what happens is when we pass away without a will in terms of interstate succession, um, there's a list of, of our heirs, and that would be um, children if we've got them or parents. And if you don't have a spouse or children or parents it would then go to your siblings in terms of south african law and if you don't have siblings um you then go further into um you know extended family if there really is absolutely no extended family and you have to prove to the master that you've hired a tracing agent you've gone onto facebook and all sorts of social media that really helps us nowadays to try and find people but if you don't find someone um then by default the um the estate devolves upon upon the state but we generally end up do finding someone and we have to advertise as well and then someone does come onto the woodwork to try and claim okay if I can pass this on to uh, Sheikh Munir, uh, there are quite a few questions pertaining to trusts. So when people actually uh, create trust and they transfer their assets into a trust, how will the issue of Islamic inheritance operate there? Uh, assuming they don't, they no longer have assets in their own names, but the all the assets are now transferred into a trust. I think you're muted. All right. So shukran for that question, uh, Brother Zainal. Yes, in, in the event where a person passes away with a, um, there's a trust. Uh, that trust uh, basically deed um, or those trust property will be dealt with in terms of the constitution of that, um, that trust. So basically everything will be dealt with accordingly. So if before the person passed away, they establish a trust, they put the assets into the trust, and um, the, the provisions in the trust will then um, will, will guide as to what, what, what should happen. As far as Sharia compliance of that is concerned, it would depend what the provisions in, in, in the trust is. 
Um, therefore, I'd need to have a bit of more information concerning con concerning that. The, um, the, issue, the, yeah. the issue is uh, in terms of the Sharia Faraid heirs. So should the trust reflect or mirror the Faraid heirs? Or can it be, for example, for example, if you have uh, uh, sons and daughters uh, and you create the trust and in, in your trust you're saying that um, all my uh, heirs uh, or, or my children will, will inherit equally. So uh, what, what effectively is happening is that it cuts out, uh, let's say, all other family members or, or uh, you know, it would only restrict, uh, for example, if, if your trust only restricts your personal family, your, your children, uh, and excludes, uh, you know, other members of the family uh, who may have been uh, is had had you had all your assets in in your own name. So I think uh, if you can just uh, elaborate on that. Yeah, but basically we're looking at that question. Um, the, the the trust is not something which is akin to to Islamic law. Um, the is however in terms of Islamic law, there is the waqaf, right? You find that the general waqaf, and then you find the family waqaf, the waqaf ahli. Which are both uh, in the has certain uh, uh, requirements, but based on the, the question, I, I I I see that in order to um, try to avoid certain taxes, if you're taking the asset, let's say now um, the father owns a house and he owns, owns a number of houses, he establishes a trust, and he then transfers the, the property into the trust, and he says that at the time of my death, um, it is in my uh, instruction that. Um, that my, my the trustees of the trust must distribute that in terms of my last will and testament in terms of Sharia law, then uh, that 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 should not be an issue. Yeah, but if if the intention was that yes, it's still my property, I'm putting it in there, but it's still mine. Then yes, technically, uh, it should be distributed in terms of uh, of of the laws of inheritance as part of his property. But if his intention was, let's say, you want to establish a wakaf or whatever, a general wakaf. Uh, um, for the for the public good or for the family, then those uh, um, those the, those consequences would would then find application. So it it it, it, it depends on on the clauses in the in the actual trust deed. Okay, here's a question by Hasina, also to you, uh, uh, Sheikh. Uh, say we've spent funds on or expenses taking care of parents. Uh, so certain children may have spent a lot more on, on taking care of parents. And the person asks, can a person claim for expenses incurred while taking care of parents from a parent's estate? No. Should we go into that question? Um, that, that's a very um, uh, general question that normally applies when you're sitting in the office um, with uh, a family members who, who are now um, recipients of a Sharia will. And the daughter then says that, look here, but I've been looking after my mother for so long. Why am I then inheriting half of what my my, my brother is inheriting? So as a, as a daughter, I'm inheriting half of what the son inherits. And I've done A, B, C, and D. Um, now, with regard to that, which she has done during her lifetime, or during the lifetime of a parent, it's very important to then uh, state at that point in time, as the same with the, with the trust you're looking at, what the provisions in the trust is, is important, what the intention was and, and all of those things. What is it that you are establishing? With regard to that, looking after your parents, it could either be that uh, I've done so um, with the intention of this being a sadaqah. It's my um, gift to my parents. I want to, want to do that and I'm seeking reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is all well and done and then it's, then it's done. And that is separate to inheritance because the reward lies there. Or you could say, look here, right now, none of my other siblings are doing this, and I'm doing a favor now here on, on their behalf as well. Um, but I'm not doing it as a gift, but I'm assisting with a non uh, as a loan, but it's a non-interest bearing loan. So they don't have to pay me any more back. It's basically just a, an assistance, Qadam Hassanan, for example. Um, and in this instance, when the, the person does pass away. It doesn't only have to be a parent, it could be a sibling and so forth as well. So you're assisting with this money. And when you pass away, you would be uh, um, one of the recipients of the liabilities. And therefore, when you enter into the transaction, I'm paying for your medical expenses, I'm paying for your groceries and all of these things. 
then that discussion must take place. And it must be ascertained what was it. Was it a loan or was it a gift? If it was a gift, then, then it's over and done with. But if it's a loan, then you'd be entitled to, to, to claim back what you are entitled to as a, a creditor of that estate. Okay, a quick one, a quick one, um, Sister Rivka. Can a beneficiary be appointed as the executor of an estate? So anyone can be appointed as, as an executor. So I'm personally nominated as executor in my dad's will, and I'll also be one of his heirs. So yes, I can. As I said, you just shouldn't be the witness. Okay. Uh, now, maybe this is a very sensitive question. If, if the executor is not performing uh, and maybe unscrupulous or whatever, for whatever reason, uh, maybe unfair or unjust or in, in the execution of uh, his or her duties, can an executor be uh, dismissed or recalled? So, so the, the quick answer is yes, but it's a process because the master's office, of course, oversees the entire process. So what happens is it takes a very long time, but you would need to write to the master's office as the heirs um, and and then mention, you know, what you you have to have a detailed, uh, because quite a serious claim, so you'd have to have detail and submit that to the master's office. The master will then... Um, and, and I call it the master, but it's obviously a whole office of people that work at the master's office. Um, so at the master's office, the relevant um, estate controller or assistant master would write to the executor and would let them know ex and give them a copy of um, your complaint. And then the, the executor will have another, you know, two weeks to a month to respond. And then the master would send that on to you. Um, so it's sort of like a post office. It, they just forward the correspondence and and the master doesn't usually make a final decision. You would, as the heirs, um, probably have to go to an attorney who would um, eventually write to the master. And so we do get involved when there are cases like that. And then we write to the master and motivate why it's in the best interest of the family um, and, the, and the administration of the estate that this person be replaced. And usually when there's a dispute between family members or when there's some dodgy executor or someone involved, um, the master would generally ask the family to obtain um, an attorney's consent to act and step into the shoes of, of that person. So we end up doing that. Okay. Um, Jazakallah for that. Uh, we, we have a growing number of Muslims coming or uh, Muslims or people reverting to Islam. And we find that uh, many of their family members may not have, uh, may not be Muslim. Even, even children may not be Muslim. So how is that actually treated uh, from a Sharia perspective, uh, Sheikh? Well, shukran for that question. You know, I saw the question earlier on the, on, 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 on the page. Yes, um, if a person embraces Islam, um, it might be that uh, the, the family also embraces Islam, but there's no compulsion in them doing so. As we know, the Sharia says, La ikra deen. there's no compulsion in this deen. Now, in that instance, when I discussed uh, how the estate is distributed. We found that um, the liabilities offer is deducted there after the wasiya, and we restricted that to the one third. Um, however, if there uh, are no Islamic law beneficiaries from the mirath, uh, a sense of it, and everyone is disqualified, that technically should go to the Beitul Mal. Um, the scholars basically have differed in their opinions as to whether or not there is an established Beitul Mal and, and all of that. And therefore, um, in that instance, uh, the opinion found in the, in, within the jurisprudence is that that one third is no longer restricted um, because there are no uh, mirath beneficiaries. Um, so in that instance, I would advise that the person then follow the opinion that that one third is no longer restricted and he can or she can bequeath the complete three thirds in favor of uh, the wasiya beneficiaries, right? And that would be obviously after checking everywhere, is there a distant uncle or cousin, whatever it might be, um, something similar to what uh, Rifqa has referred to early on with regard to the laws of intestate succession within the South African context. Okay, I think, I think that's uh, an important clarification, Sheikh. 
uh, we really have, I think, many questions and many uh, uh, people coming into the fold of Islam that has that have this particular issue at hand. And I think this uh, really clarifies it uh, quite clearly. Um, coming to the issue of Yusuf Raks. Um, now, I think that uh, one of the issues that people have is that, uh, for example, I think Refka, you, you mentioned earlier, where mom gets one eighth of the estate, but uh, mom can actually become homeless if the if the house has to be sold. So how does one actually protect mom uh, through a usufruct? And is this maybe both of you can uh, can interact on this one here uh, from a legal perspective as well as a Sharia perspective? So when it comes to the, the legal position, um, so a Yusuf right is the second strongest right of ownership. Short of legally owning the property, you have full rights other than, you know, owning the property itself. So it's quite a restriction on ownership when, so if you're leaving your property to someone subject to a Yusuf right, you've got to be very mindful that you're actually restricting that right and are you then leaving it are you leaving them then their true share because it is a very restrictive right the usufructory it gets a personal right that usufructory right is limited to that person only and it's limited for a certain period it's either the usufruct for mom's lifetime or sometimes um, the, the common one is it's um, it, mom has a use of right in respect of this property until she remarries and then she's going to have to go and live with her husband or it might be for a certain time frame you could give someone a use of right say for five years whatever so that's got to be specified um, in the will it can't be decided after and if it if it only says a use of right then the default is it's for mom's lifetime what it means is mom can actually move in and out of that property and she won't lose the right and that people often ask well mom's moved out and she's gone to live with my sister for the last five years it doesn't matter she's still got a legal right of use of right which is recorded against the title deed when you have clauses like use of rights and anything where you've got um, specific things in the will, you need to state who's covering those costs because a use of fructory has full right of use to that property, meaning that when there is rental income, if there is someone living in the granny flat and mom has a use of right over the property, mom actually has the right to the rental income. So you have to be very specific and not just say mom has the right of use of right. You have to say, when I pass away, my wife has the right of use of right, but when it comes to any rental income that goes to the owners of the property, the other heirs that I've left the property to, you've also got to specify who pays the rates and services because that's very contentious and people fight over all sorts of mad things. And so you've got to say, well, mom's got a use of right, but your mom should not be paying the rates and services. Well, then who's paying the rates and services and where's the income for that? So you're putting that obligation then on someone else who owns the property, who might not be living there, enjoying, um, you know, that water and electricity, but you're putting that obligation on someone else, or you have to make provision for some cash, and, and then mom can live there, and you've made provision for the cash for that as well. Um, and, and a use of rack costs at the moment about 10,000 rand to register, just so that you know. Okay, so from a Sharia perspective, Shem? Yes, Shukran for that. Yes, from a Sharia perspective, as, as we stated, uh, when I looked at uh, the devolution of the estate and how the, the shares are distributed, um, that would fall under the Wasiya clause. Um, however, within the Islamic context, it might be a bit problematic because a Wasiya cannot be given to a, a Mirath beneficiary. And normally, um, now it would be the wife would be the Mirath beneficiary. Um, however, within the Islamic context, there is something which is referred to as the Umrah which is now basically usage of the property. And uh, that, however, would fall outside of the will. So if you would want to then uh, ensure that the wife or the husband, whoever the owner of the property is, uh, wants to ensure that the other spouse, the spouse in the event of passing on would be entitled to remain in the property and have usage of the property for the rest of their life, um, you could make use of the Umrah by stating that while you are alive, registering it, uh, uh, against the title deed or on uh, 
as uh, again as via conveyance or via notary public in the deeds office, and that uh, then it's basically given when you are alive, and that doesn't form part of the the will. The um, bare dominion, however, the ownership of the property um, will then transfer onto the will be registered on the on, on, on all the Islamic law beneficiaries, which would could possibly would include the surviving spouse uh, being either the one eighth or the one quarter, and um, but that surviving spouse would then still have if, if that person is the recipient of the yusufrat or the lifelong yusufrat in terms of the umrah for the rest of his or her life. Um, this one, however, would be um, optional. Uh, however, there is sometimes a bit of an issue concerning, as Ruf has mentioned now, about 10,000 rand for the registration of, of something of this nature. And that is basically where it becomes a bit problematic. So, so just following on that, uh, what if... Um, uh, well, let, let's put it this way, that uh, we're talking about a house in question. Uh, where the, the spouse, the surviving spouse, will need to be living there uh, when uh, the other spouse has passed on. Uh, so is there then a restriction on the sale of that house so that uh, the other beneficiaries will just have to wait, wait it out until, uh, until mom or dad passes on? So, so yes and no. The, the, there is a right to mom. So let's say the use of is there for mom's lifetime. She can waive that um, when the property needs to be sold. So let's say the property needs to be sold. She is a co-seller because she's actually got a very strong right. So legally, a use of actually signs the agreement of sale as, as one of the sellers. Um, so she would have to consent to the sale. And in that case, when clients approach us, we then... Um, check and make sure that the property they're moving to next, let's say they can't afford this big family house anymore, they're moving to something smaller, um, they would either have to register a use of product that mom is protected, um, which is actually the only protection, um, to show us that mom is protected, and then on that basis she would then be able to sign the consent, or she waives her use of product, or she signs um, as co-seller, so that the property can be signed, this can be sold, and then they buy something smaller, and we register a use of product over that property. But yes, if if mom doesn't agree, which she doesn't have to, and then no one can sell the property, and you can't bond a property either where there's a use of right unless mom waives her right. She can't consent to the bond. The banks won't agree to that. The banks want a waiver. So mom would have to waive her right to the use of right if one of the children wants to bond the property. Okay. Just uh, Allah for that. So uh, here's a question which, again, Sheikh, you know, this, uh, this type of question keeps coming up. What are the Islamic rulings on gifting or hiba uh, items, gifting hiba items whilst one is still alive? I think it has something to do perhaps also with what you just mentioned about the Yusufrat or the Umrah. Uh, so what are the Islamic rulings on gifting items while one is still alive, but yet uh, the, the, the gifter or the one who's giving the gifts still keeps these items in their own possession until passing. But it's public knowledge or the family knowledge that these items have been gifted to so-and-so, maybe gifted to the spouse, for example. Yeah. Now, she come to that, and that is basically a common question that, 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 that arises and something which happens. And I take it that you're referring to now movable properties, could be a phone or a laptop or, or, or so forth. Um, as, as, as long as there was actual transfer of uh, and, and position has taken place, so I've I have a, a, a watch and I, I I give it I gift it to my daughter um, during my lifetime and she accepts that that gift and I, I give it over to her and she, for example takes it home uh, or to her room and then uh, five minutes later she comes out and I says look I asked the curate uh, is it okay if I wear the watch. And she says, yes. So technically, I've gifted the watch to her during her lifetime. She has taken possession of it. She became the owner of it. And now, um, for the next 10 years, I'm wearing the watch. And it's public knowledge. All the family members know that I've given the, the watch to her. They have been witnesses to that. So when I pass away, all she does is she just claims the, the watch back uh, in this regard. But what is important to note is that it, it should actually be uh, a, a, a transfer of the asset and possession. 
Um, it should not be a situation where I said, you know, I got this watch, and uh, one, once I pass away, um, my daughter is going to get it. So that's your wasiya. So that is the difference, the, the, the small difference between the, the gift during, during your lifetime and, and possession and ownership had taken place. And the other one is that where you are saying that when I pass away, then she will receive this, and this is now the, the bequest or the wasiya, and the, the issue of her benefiting from the bequest, and she's already a miraf beneficiary, um, is also something which is problematic. Um, if I could just jump in here, so Sheikh Munir, do you agree? I mean, as an attorney, you know, I know we love paperwork and I like things documented. So if there is gifting during your lifetime, I certainly recommend to clients that that's recorded so that the, it just reduces the disputes and the drama when someone passes away. Because sometimes everyone might know that that was given to that child during your lifetime and suddenly someone forgets conveniently and then the drama starts and then we don't have any proof of that. So do you recommend that um, clients record those kind of gifts? Yes, definitely. I would I would agree with it 100%. And, and even when I deal with clients, I do exactly the same thing. I haven't refused to write thing and I have them sign it, especially those beneficiaries who might dispute later on and the document is with them. So even though the actual item is would have been with the deceased prior to having passed on, um, with the documents, you can just claim it back. So I, I totally agree with you. And certainly when it comes to, um, you know, property also, because there are those family meetings that people famously have, and then, you know, mom and dad will call everyone around and say, you all know that when I pass away, this house must go to so-and-so and or whatever it is. And so, and then we've maybe just got that, um, that very standard will which says, um, you know, the, the estate should just go to my Islamic heirs. But um, what I do like clients to do is if they can think about in the estate planning, what assets do you have? What can we actually help you to put down in your will so that you can limit the drama and the disputes and you can actually say, well, I'm still leaving things in my Islamic heirs. I'm, an, oh, I'm leaving things in my Islamic heirs, but I'm going to end up, um, sorry. I'm going to limit things to my Islamic is. Um, I'm going to leave things to my Islamic is in the shares, but at the same time, I'm going to. I've got um, business assets that my son's involved with. He's going to get based on the value. You know, he's getting the business shares, and my daughters are getting the house, and someone else is getting cash. So you still end up with your same Islamic shares, um, but you're just getting specific assets that make that up. Just to avoid drama, if there is a specific family like that where you actually need to direct them more in a will. I think we're running out of time now, but I just want to, uh, just following on this one year. Um, so, for example, we're doing the Hiba Umrah uh, with regard to the, the gift. But now in the case of a property where we uh, where we where we don't want to actually do the actual transfer and and uh, do the transfer cost because you know, once it's done through the will there won't be any transfer cost there but if we're doing it outside of the will uh, during our lifetimes there, there may be a transfer cost involved there so uh, so uh, if if we're documenting this as a donation deed for example or a hiba deed, uh, and we 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 stating clearly that this is uh, a, a, the the use of this property or the use of fruct is going to my spouse uh, during her lifetime uh, until her death, uh, w without the actual possession and without the actual transfer of the property. Sheikh. Yeah, um, she can do that. Um, in, in this instance, as, as long as what has been documented is confirmed in the will, right? so it's not two different things being stated, then it shouldn't be a problem. But there might be certain um, uh, implications as far as tax is concerned. Uh, and uh, Rifka would be able to, as a conveyancer, discuss more about that. So if the, there was a, 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 a document formulated where the person is saying, I'm giving you this as... as um, a, a lifelong user front over the property has been signed and all of this and it's confirmed in the will, then it, I, I wouldn't see that to be any, any okay. problems as far as the is concerned. Okay. So sometimes uh, in order to reduce the, the burden of debt within the estate, uh, there is an issue where, for example, uh, we can create a debt and sometimes people create debts 
with the issue of mahar. So the question is, can the mahar be increased after the nikah as a debt to be paid on death? I think that's for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely that, 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 that can be done as long as it's a, a true debt. Um, okay, the scholars that have stated at the time of the nikah, you, you have that um, amount that is paid as a mahar a, a deferred dawa that, that is all in order. And as far as um, post marriage, whether or not to increase a dawa, that the, the, the majority of scholars or many scholars say that there should, should not be a problem with that. But the main thing is it should be something real. So you can't say, okay, right, I'm giving you this, uh, increasing the dawa to 2 million rand um, to create a debt. But uh, then later on, when, when there is a talaq or a fast, he says, no, no, actually, that's not what I meant. It should actually be something real, which means that if uh, that was a true debt now created, now due to the, the, the mahar or the maskari or the dawah, then automatically all other legal consequences should follow from that, uh, from that uh, position. Then, then it shouldn't be a problem. Okay. Well, anyway, I think we've run uh, out of time and we've come to the end of this program. But before we close off, I think we really need to say Jazakallah khairan to all the viewers out there, all those people that have registered and all those that are listening to this program on YouTube and Facebook. Jazakallah khairan. Thank you very much. Bye, Danki. Nyabonga for coming on board and, and listening to this. And I'm sure it, it must have been very, very insightful as it was for me as well. And inshallah, uh, there are many, many questions which I hope that our esteemed guests will uh, take the time to look at them again and perhaps if we can uh, submit an answer to you by email or so we try to do that uh, we can see that there are many many issues and there are many many cases that people have actually um, asked us to have a look at as well but unfortunately we don't really have the time for that uh, we may as a matter of uh, a follow-up uh, have a further kind of session if if it's so uh, uh, warranted and then we can we, we, inshallah uh, you know address many more issues but one can see that uh, the whole issue of wills and estate planning is so important that people can uh, you know the the families can be uh, can can be separated families due to squabbles can uh, can have enemies for life and you know I mean, we, we see this and we experience this all the time so uh, in order to to have that good relationships with people and family and so forth it's best to discuss these issues prior to death with the family uh, sit around the table you know have a discussion uh, clarify what what's going to happen to the estate uh, uh, so that you know, you, you avoid all those kind of pitfalls. Make sure that the will is uh, properly prepared, properly signed. Uh, well, one of the things is that it's got to be signed in the presence of the witnesses as well, uh, at the same time, in the same place. So you can't say, well, look, uh, uh, I'm signing today as a witness and tomorrow somebody else is signing as a witness. No, they all have to be done together. So... Uh, once again, uh, thank you very much. Jazakallah khairan. Islamic worlds are important. I don't believe that uh, standard Islamic worlds are good enough. I think that one needs to get uh, proper advice uh, on every issue. Each person's case is different. And, and, and a standard Islamic world doesn't cater for everybody's needs. So uh, in, in a way, it's good to have one. It must be done. But at the same time, one needs to have uh, good advice as well. So I'm going to ask Sheikh to close this session uh, with a dua, and we hope, inshallah, that uh, all the listeners and viewers out there would have had tremendous benefit out of this, and at least it will start making us think about Islamic worlds and estate planning. Jazakallah khairan. Barakallahu feek. Sheikh, over to you. الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا وحبيبنا ومولانا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين 
اللهم ربنا لا تقبل منا انك انت السميع العليم وتب علينا انك انت التواب الرحيم واهدنا ووفقنا الى الحق وإلى طريق المستقيم ببركه القران الكريم اللهم ربنا زدنا علما وارزقنا فهما واغفر لنا ذنوبنا وذنوب والدينا ولمشايخنا ولجميع المسلمين اجمعين يا ايها الذين امنوا اصبروا وصابروا ورابطوا واتقوا الله لعلكم تفلحون وتمت كلمه ربك صدقا وعدلا لا مبدل لكلماته وهو السميع العليم سبحان ربك رب العزه عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين امين جزاك الله خيرا once again جزاك الله thank you to Sheikh Munir thank you to Sister Rifka for your wonderful inputs and we hope to see you again inshallah in the future and all the viewers out there we hope to see you uh, also and please do keep in touch we hope to keep in touch with you as well assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh when we take care of each other wonderful things happen children thrive the elderly rejoice and communities celebrate Okaf South Africa, a charitable wakaf organization, makes it easy to share the care. All donations are plowed into Sharia-compliant investments, while the fruits support a wide variety of charitable causes. Visit okafsa.org.za to discover how your wakaf can bless our community with a legacy of care.